welcome back to the Wellness Paradox podcast. I'm so grateful that you can join us on this journey towards greater human flourishing. As always, I'm your host, Michael Stack, an exercise physiologist by training and a health entrepreneur and a health educator by trade. And I'm fascinated by a phenomena I call the wellness paradox. This paradox, as I view it, is the trust, interaction, and communication gap between fitness professionals and our medical community. This podcast is all about closing off that gap by disseminating the latest, most evidence-based, and most engaging information in the health sciences. And to do this in episode 74, I'd like to follow up on episode 71. I received a lot of great feedback from many of you uh, when I talked about the four critical steps that we need to do as an industry in order to become part of the healthcare delivery system. And a lot of the comments and, and feedback I received were around the outcomes element that I discussed. And, and that's what I'd like to unpack a little bit in this short conversation today is not only the importance of the outcome data that we collect from our clients and from our patient populations, but also how to do that properly and then what to do with it after the fact. So to take you back to episode 71, I mentioned that becoming part of healthcare means being outcome oriented. Uh, bottom line, that's how healthcare works. In healthcare, you are reimbursed largely for outcomes. And as healthcare moves more towards value-based care and bundled-based payments and things like capitation that limit the amount that you can be reimbursed for the things that you're doing in healthcare, uh, it's going to become even more and more outcome-oriented. So if we as an industry are going to move in that direction, we have to be incredibly outcome-oriented. Now, what does that mean? Well, traditionally, what that's meant in our industry is we've tried to influence body composition to some substantive degree. First and foremost, I think we can all categorically agree that we, as not just a fitness community, but as a broader health sciences and allied health community, have done a very, very poor job at helping move the needle on body composition and body mass in this country. Uh, Many of you are well aware that clinically significant weight loss is only 5% of total body weight. And maintaining that weight loss for a 12-month period of time is considered to be kind of the the clinically significant standard. And we know that far less than 10% of people that enter into a weight loss program or a weight loss journey actually maintain that loss of 5% or more of their body weight for 12 months or more. So we've been broadly unsuccessful at helping people lose body mass and maintain that loss of body mass. Now, that doesn't mean that we should not strive to have body fat reduction or body mass reduction as a goal to our program because you know, certainly you know, individuals who have obesity are predisposed to a litany of health concerns, but I think it's important to broaden our perspective on what outcome measures are because the traditional outcome measure that we've used in our industry and, and in other industries um, that are in the allied health space to a great extent, has has largely been ineffective in a very reductionistic way to think about outcomes that we produce. So I want to enter into this conversation broadly defining how we can look at outcomes. Now, first and foremost, before we ever talk about those outcomes, we need to talk about a way to effectively collect and manage that outcome data over time. Now, Now, this is not a statistics podcast, nor is this an information technology podcast. So I'm not going to dive into all the nuances there, except to say some type of simple spreadsheet and or databasing function for you to not only be able to track individual client or patient data, but also group data from patients or clients is critically important. I think one thing to consider, and we'll talk about this towards the end of the conversation when we're talking about who we report data back to, these outcomes back to, and in what format we provide them, uh, we just can't do it at an individual level. Many of you that read research understand that the sample size of a population absolutely matters. And an N of one, what you've done for one client isn't compelling outcome data to report. We need to be reporting outcome data from large cohorts of people so we can actually establish some volume and consistency to the outcomes that you're producing. So all of that to say, 
utilize some type of simplistic data input and tracking system. A Google Sheet, an Excel spreadsheet will work very, very well for this purpose. You don't need anything more sophisticated than that. There are some commercially available softwares that exist out there off the shelf that will do some of this for you. Uh, but from my experience, just using a good old spreadsheet, Google Sheet, Excel uh, is more than adequate for collecting that data. And then any of the statistical analyses you'll need to run on that data over time can be simply done through the stats function on any of those spreadsheet programs. So with that as a little bit of a backdrop, let's talk about what comprises a good comprehensive outcomes-based assessment for a fitness professional. And I want to divide this up into two categories, a subjective and an objective category. So we'll start with subjective and subjective are certain validated questionnaires. Now I'll link up to some of these validated questionnaires on the show notes page. I'm not gonna bother to give you the specific names of them right now, just simply because uh, they're long and they're cumbersome. But essentially these are questionnaires that ask individuals about their levels of function, their levels of pain, their levels of fatigue, their mental health, all of this subjective data which when you hear subjective, you kind of think, okay, well, is that an important outcome metric? And on a lot of levels, I would say absolutely, because it gets to the heart of how someone is feeling. And ultimately at the end of the day, if we can get people to feel better, we know that makes some large inroads to allowing them and, and making them function better. Uh, but we do have to use the right questionnaires. They do have to be validated for the populations that we're working with. Uh, they have to be reliable and consistent over time. You just can't grab any old questionnaire off the internet and hope that it's going to adequately reflect someone's physical activity status or mental health over a period of time. We need to make sure that those questionnaires are validated for the populations we're working with and they are reliable. And this concept of validity and reliability is going to come up throughout this discussion. Uh, validity is simply a test measuring what it's supposed to measure, and reliability is the consistency of that test over time. So we ideally want tests that are both highly valid and highly reliable. Uh, however, as long as they are reasonably valid, since we're not conducting clinical research, as long as the tests are reasonably conducting um, and, and tracking what we want them to, then it's a lot more important that these tests are reliable than they are 100% valid because we really just want to track change over time with our clients. You know, as an example, a body composition assessment, we'll say skinfold calipers, uh, it might not be the most valid measure of human body composition and percentage of body fat, but at least if it's consistent over time, we're able to track change, which ultimately is really what we care about. Yes, in an ideal world, we would like to have the most clinically sophisticated measures that we possibly can to be able to track track very accurately someone's absolute change over time, meaning I was 20% body fat, I'm now 10% body fat. I know definitively I went from 20 to 10% body fat. Uh, that's probably not realistic given the constraints that many of us have in the commercial non-clinical settings that we work in. So we want to ensure reliability even more so than validity. As long as the test is reasonably valid, if we can create a high degree of reliability, then we can measure change over time, which allows us to be able to show that we are producing positive health and fitness outcomes with our clients. So to, to circle back around, we want tests that are as valid as they possibly can be for the non-clinical settings that we work in, but are highly reliable. And we talked first about the concept of questionnaires and, and subjective outcome measures. So we need to use validated questionnaires. These validated questionnaires have been validated in research to measure what they're supposed to measure, and they tend to be reliable over the course of time. And we can also extrapolate that to all of our more physical or um, fitness-based biometrics that we measure on our clients. So as we start to think about these other biometrics that we're looking at for our clients, we can break these down you know, really into what I'll call four categories. The first is a body composition category. Second would be a mobility or flexibility category. 
Third, we would have a muscular fitness category. And fourth, we would have a, a cardiovascular fitness category, aerobic fitness. So we're going to talk about each of these very briefly. Again, this isn't a deep dive in all these. This is just to get your brain thinking around what you can be measuring from an outcome perspective for your clients and then how you can be reporting it. So with regard to body composition, uh, without getting too deep into the weeds here, um, I, I hate to break it to everyone, but the actual measurement of percent body fat is far less accurate or valid than what we think it is. And there's a, a long drawn out scientific discussion here around the criterion methods for determining human body composition. And that's beyond the scope of this podcast. But what I will tell you, if you know anything about human body composition is that you know, skin fold calipers tend to be uh, a very challenging measurement method to utilize on clients. Anyone who's ever taken skin fold calipers knows that it can be challenging. Uh, you know that different testers can produce different results in terms of the outcome. So if a client had their body fat measured by a trainer six years ago, and then they had their body fat measured by you today, the mere fact that you are two different people and will make that skin fold pinch slightly differently can greatly influence you know, body composition analysis and ultimately that outcome measure. Uh, other non-clinical measures like biological impedance analysis, the handheld device or the scale you stand on, uh, the ones that are what I'd call non-clinical or relatively inexpensive, um, those are notoriously inaccurate and unreliable. Even some of the more sophisticated biological impedance methods like an in-body as an example, which is a, a very high-end clinical biological impedance analysis device, even those have some issues with validity, like actually measuring what they can measure. Uh, certainly clinical devices reduce that variability and improve that reliability. Uh, bod pods, DEXA, underwater weighing, but you know, none of us have access to these types of devices. So when I'm thinking in terms of how I measure body composition for my standard adult general population client, the intersection of two measurements I really like. The first one is BMI. And I know when you hear me say BMI, you go, oh, Mike, well, what about the people who have a lot of muscle tissue on their body? You know, my BMI says I'm obese. Well, it's very, very common for those of us in the fitness industry who have a higher amount of muscle tissue because we strength train for BMI not to be accurate. But guess what? If you're a sedentary individual who's not done a lot of strength training in your life, is currently not exercising, if you have too much weight for your height, odds are it's because you have too much body fat on your frame. So using BMI is great when you use it in conjunction with a waist circumference. BMI and waist circumference are a great way to track adiposity and overall body fat in our client populations. The reason waist circumference is so powerful is that we know that fat stored viscerally, that is fat stored centrally in the midsection of the body, that's fat, excessive fat that sits on top of our vital internal organs and actually pumps out inflammatory cytokines. So we know that that fat in particular is very pathological. So if I'm looking at a way to measure body composition in my clients, using BMI and waist circumference is a great way to drill on, on health-oriented body composition measurements. Now, if you're proficient with skin fold calipers, you do have one of those clinical BIA devices, such as an in-body or some of the other ones that are on the market, and you're ensuring that you maintain a consistent measurement environment, and we'll talk more about that towards the end in terms of pre-measurement protocol, then maybe you can add in and layer in that biological impedance analysis measure or skin fold calipers to your body composition analysis. But don't discount the intersection of BMI and waist circumference. Very powerful. Next outcome measure is what we'll call movement screening, mobility screening, flexibility screening. Uh, there are a number of these screens out there. Uh, and not that I'm looking to commercially suggest you know, one screen or another, but the functional movement screen, the FMS, is, is a pretty good comprehensive evaluation. Now, there's a lot of consternation in the literature out there as to how reliable and valid 
the functional movement screen and similar types of movement screens are. So I definitely think you have to use these you know, at your own discretion with clients, because this is certainly a little bit of a subjective screen because you're ultimately looking at how somebody moves. Um, there also are a number of uh, video analyses technologies that are out there now that will actually allow you to videotape a movement doing uh, a client doing a movement, I should say. And sometimes I think that could be the most valuable. Like if you're thinking in terms of, of movement screening a client, I would say the two things that are very worthwhile looking at, one is just a video analysis of the client's ability to squat, the depth that they squat with, the torso position they maintain, you know, are their knees, you know, moving in or out laterally? You know, what does a squat look like? Because the squat is arguably the most functional movement that we perform during the course of our day. So to the extent you can capture, at least on video, what a squat looks like and be able to show that change measurably over time, uh, that can result in uh, at least a very good subjective evaluation of how the individual is improving what I consider to be the most functional form of mobility, doing a proper squat. Another movement screen or flexibility test that I really do like is what we'll call a back scratch test. Some of you are, are very familiar with this. This is when you place one hand in your lower back, one hand on your upper back and try to touch your hands together. This is a great shoulder mobility screen. And if you think about it, if a client has solid shoulder mobility and they can perform a decent full range of motion squat, let's just say they can at least get to, you know, close to parallel to the ground, uh, with their femur, with their heels on the ground and their chest up, then that's an individual that I feel pretty confident has good functional mobility. I'd like to take a quick break from today's episode to tell you more about one of our sponsors. As all of you are well aware, the COVID-19 pandemic has been absolutely devastating for the fitness industry, with upwards of one third of our clubs closing nationally on a permanent basis. One of the few stabilizing forces during this very tumultuous period of time has been URSA, the Global Trade Association for the Health and Fitness Industry. On my crusade to make fitness professionals part of our healthcare continuum, the work that URSA is doing is absolutely vital. They provide advocacy and lobbying support at both the federal and the state level. They support state alliances in many ways and they also provide resources and best practices to club owners, operators, and individual fitness professionals. Indeed, if we are truly going to become part of the healthcare continuum, we must speak with one unified voice, we must have best practices that we implement, and we must come together as an industry to ensure the public, the medical community, and lawmakers hear our message loud and clear that movement is medicine and it is essential. That is the work that URSA is doing. They've recently revamped their membership structure, allowing large clubs, small clubs, boutiques, and individual professionals to join the organization for an appropriate price that allows them to have access to all of these many great resources and allows us to unify and amplify our voice as an industry. For more information on the amazing work that URSA is doing, go to their website, ursa.org. That's I-H-R-S-A dot org. I-H-R-S-A dot org to look in a little bit further into the work Ursa is doing to unify our industry, to move us closer to being a part of that healthcare continuum. Now back to today's episode. In terms of muscular fitness, uh, I like to think in terms of simple tests. Certainly, you know, many of you are well aware of doing a, a one rep max on a bench or a one rep max on a squat. Uh, great for athletes and power lifters, but certainly not appropriate for the adult general population clients that we work with. So to that end, I like two very simple assessments to be able to determine someone's overall muscular fitness. The first one is a grip strength assessment. Um, you can purchase a hand grip dynamometer for a very small amount of money. You can buy these on Amazon for you know, less than $50. And it measures grip strength, which although grip strength isn't overall body strength, it is a good proxy 
for overall body strength. In fact, there's been some tremendous research done that suggests that higher levels of grip strength are more predictive of reductions in cardiovascular disease, more predictive of reductions in mortality and morbidity um, than almost any other fitness metric that we can measure. And it's not that having a strong grip results in a great reduction in morbidity and mortality. It's that it's just a proxy for the fact that you're physically active doing things and probably maintaining a decent amount of muscle mass um, relative to your functional requirements of your daily life. So grip strength works great. Um, you can also purchase a leg and back dynamometer if you wanted to look at overall body strength. So this is overall pulling body strength. Uh, but the other assessment I like to use is a lower body muscular endurance assessment. I like to use a body weight squat assessment. This is simply number of body weight squats performed two parallel in 60 seconds. The reason I like this is the functional nature of what a squatting motion is, as well as the fact that this is testing a muscular endurance capacity in the lower extremity where I'm testing uh, a strength capacity, an isometric strength capacity in the upper extremity. So that kind of gives me a good balance. Now, there are certainly other muscular fitness assessments you can do. Um, you know, for individuals who are older, there are some validated protocols for chair stands and arm curls. Um, you know, there's tests that also involve you know, power assessments such as med ball throws and maybe vertical jumps. Again, probably not appropriate for adult general population, probably a little bit more appropriate for um, your athlete populations. But capturing muscular fitness can be done very simply through that hand grip dynamometer test, as well as a body weight squat test to assess muscular endurance. And then to round out, the last element of a good comprehensive biometric evaluation is aerobic capacity. And there are a number of different tests that you can use to do this. Um, there's a three-minute step test that can be used. Uh, you can also simply use a 12-minute walk-run test, which is probably one of the easier tests to administer for the adult general population. It can be done on a treadmill basically the maximum distance that an individual can cover in 12 minutes. Uh, when you do it on a treadmill and you put the treadmill on a 1% grade to simulate outdoor walking, and you can actually use a conversion equation to convert distance covered in 12 minutes to VO2 max. Um, and that is kind of your gold standard of aerobic capacity. Uh, the 12 minute walk run test is, is validated for what I would call a sedentary to low level of fitness. I would greatly under predict the VO2 max or aerobic capacity of somebody who is moderately to very fit. And again, this goes back to making sure you use the right test for the population. So if we were to look at these in their totality and we're looking at you know, what are things that we can use for outcome measures on our clients, I think validated subjective questionnaires at the very least for you know, physical activity levels, functional status and pain, and then mental health, very, very important for us to be able to track those subjective measures. And then in terms of objective measures and objective biometrics, BMI and waist circumference with the bonus of percent body fat if you have a what you believe to be a reliable method to track change over time. Uh, using some type of mobility screen, again, even a video analysis of a squat and just the simple back scratch test to determine shoulder mobility, very high mileage assessment. That, that video evaluation of a squat is the true embodiment of a picture being worth a thousand words. If you think of the clients you've worked with, what their squats look like on day one and what their squats look like on day 60, just imagine if you could capture that visually on video, how powerful that would be for you to see, for the client to see, and, and ultimately, as we're going to talk about in a second, uh, that client's physician to see. Muscular fitness, again, I like a simple hand grip dynamometer and body weight squat test, and then for aerobic capacity. I like the 12 minute walk run test provided it's appropriate for the individual you're testing. So th that's the battery of biometrics that I like to collect on clients. So, so once you have that, then the question becomes, well, what do you do with it? Well, first off, you need to reevaluate on a periodic basis. Uh, my recommendation is every 90 days for clients that are newer 
working with you. And if someone's worked with you for longer than two years, you probably could space them out every six months just because fitness adaptation is slow over time. But initially, it's really important to get that 90-day snapshot of the improvement that your client is seeing. And this not only does something good for the client, but it also does something good for you. It basically holds both you and the client accountable to the goals that you're setting. So if your program is effective and they're implementing it effectively, we should expect to see some positive movement on all of these uh, subjective and objective metrics. Uh, if something's not moving in the right direction, then it becomes the conversation around lack of compliance on behalf of the client or is it a matter of improper program design on your part? So it's a great accountability tool. But I need to kind of expand this and, and blow this up to the bigger picture. And this is where it can become really valuable. When we get all of this outcome data together, if we can tie it to an individual's health biometrics, we could tie it to their blood pressure, their medication use, uh, their symptomology, for a specific condition. Uh, we can tie it into their fasting blood glucose, so their A1C, their cholesterol levels, all of these health biometrics. If we can show health biometrics improving concurrently with our fitness and wellness biometrics, now we could start to make a compelling case that what we're doing is part of healthcare. So what I'll often ask my patients and clients to do is you know, every time we're doing an assessment, I say, hey, do you have updated information? Do you have updated labs, cholesterol levels, fasting blood glucose, A1C, whatever you can give me, I'd like to know that update. I like to make sure I know it when we start. So I strongly encourage people when they're starting a program of physical activity and exercise and they're going to go through this more formal fitness assessment process that they get labs done, they go to their doctor, they get their blood pressure taken, we get that baseline series of health biometrics. And then over time, we can marry them up with our fitness biometrics to actually correlate fitness improvement to health improvement. We can't take for granted that both individuals and physicians see that. We actually have to connect the dots for them. And if you're doing both types of evaluations, the medical evaluation and the fitness evaluation, concurrently, frequently, and in sequence with each other, then we can actually start to make some of these claims. And then here's where it becomes really powerful. You can provide a report for your client to provide to their physician. And when you start to do this, when every time that, that client goes to see their physician, they have an update on their fitness status from, from you, not just the subjective and outcome, uh, subjective and objective outcome measures, but also your adherence, your compliance, what you've been doing, other anecdotal and subjective information that they want to share that you're comfortable sharing with the physician. Now, all of a sudden, the physician starts to see, wow. This individual, this, this fitness professional here is starting to produce tangible outcomes that I can clearly see tied to this individual's healthcare. And now all of a sudden the physicians are to say, wait a second, this is going to make my job a heck of a lot easier because if this person's getting healthier because they're improving their overall physical fitness, then I'm going to get to spend less time in appointments with them. They're going to see me less frequently. And I know you might think, well, if they see them less frequently, are they not making as much money? And that would be the case if there were a finite number of people to see, but there is an infinite number of people to see in medicine and doctors are so backed up right now that they would love the ability for a fitness professional like you to unburden them from some of the things that they have to do with regard to lifestyle counseling in their appointments, with the, which they don't have time or expertise for, for that matter. So uh, this is how we, we, allow the rubber to meet the road in terms of producing outcomes. We have a very specific intangible assessment process that we can use in our clients that evaluates both subjective and objective metrics that we can use and track over time to show change in fitness and wellness, and then marry those up with their health metrics to show how improvements in fitness and wellness result in improvements in outcome-based healthcare, which are all those measures that people get when they go to the doctor. 
Now, the last thing to talk about on this is if you're going to do a proper fitness evaluation on your client, uh, you need to ensure reliability, as we talked about earlier, the ability to, to measure things consistently over time. To do that, uh, providing your client with an appropriate pre-measurement protocol and explanation as to what is going to happen is critically important. So pre-measurement protocol should talk about things like you know, what to wear, how much sleep to get before you do the test the night before, what to have before the test, um, everything associated with keeping that measurement environment as stable and consistent as possible every time you do it to ensure the reliability of test. Again, we care a lot more about reliability on these than we do validity. So if somebody does a series of tests with you when they start and they slept well the night before, they ate a good breakfast, they weren't sore, and then they do a series of tests with you. Then three months later, they didn't sleep well the night before, uh, they didn't have breakfast, and they were sore from the workouts that they've done. That's going to impair the results on the test, and it's going to hinder your reliability significantly. So making sure that you're providing them that pre-measurement protocol ahead of time, making sure you're providing them with informed consent, meaning like they're informed enough to consent to having the test done, knowing that they can terminate any test at any time for any reason. Now, again, this was a, a quick kind of dive into, maybe even a dip into the idea of how we you know, produce and collect these tangible outcomes. I think the last step that we need to take as an industry, at least on a grassroots level, is you as a fitness professional aggregating all of your data and saying, hey, my average client loses you know, this much BMI, this much waist circumference, they improve their aerobic capacity by this much or that much. Being able to take cohort level data and have that available to show to prospective clients, to show to members of the allied health and public health community, to show to politicians and so on, that can be very, very powerful. Long story short was we will never become part of healthcare until we start to produce tangible outcomes on a, on a cohort level. It can't just be an N01. It just can't be one person. It has to be, hey, you are consistently in your practice producing tangible, significant, and measurable outcomes. There is a path to do this. The tools are out there to do this. We just need to invest the time to get proficient in these measurement techniques. And then we need to provide the environment and the time to our clients to be able to measure this appropriately when they start with us and then periodically as they continue to work with us. And then we have to make sure we're reporting this data back to our clients' physicians. Almost always that's gonna be in the form of a printed letter that you give them to take to their physician. But if you can somehow get it directly to their physician electronically, even better. But the path is there, the tools are there, we just have to commit to these outcomes. It's through committing to these outcomes that over the course of time, we will progressively transition onto the healthcare continuum. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that conversation. I hope it gave you some food for thought. I will link up on the show notes page the things I talked about uh, on the podcast episode, some resources to help you uh, administer some of these subjective and objective evaluations a little bit better. Uh, that can be found on the show notes page for this episode. That's wellnessparadoxpod.com forward slash episode seven four. Please be on the lookout for next week's episode when it drops on Wednesday. And don't forget to subscribe through your favorite podcast platform. Until we chat again next week. Please be well.